Hey folks, this is Pastor Mike, and you're listening to our Wednesday night Bible study online. We hope you enjoy this, and you can hear more of our sermons and teachings at www.visitbethelchurch.org. God bless you, and have a great day. Gary and I have a brief little uh, play to put on tonight. (laughs) Nice little drama. All these churches were doing dramas for Easter. And uh, Gary and I have a little production we worked. I, I don't need you right this second. I'll, I'll get to you in a minute. He's so eager to get up here and have everybody stare at him. <clears throat> so anyway, good to be here tonight. Amen. How many of you had a long day today? Long day, Jim? This long? Longer? I'm getting there. Huh? Anyway, this will be a good Good way to end the day today. Amen Amen to that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate you being here. Pray for one another tonight. Just kind of look around the congregation and just pick somebody and pray for them. You just never know. God might be in that. God was always in in drawing lots. Did you ever notice that in the Bible? That they drew lots and that's how they selected Matthias to be the replacement apostle. And God was always in that. God was in that, that selection process. They just left it up. It's, there's, I don't believe in luck. Amen. I don't believe in chance, random. I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe in anything like that. And, and so just maybe just kind of look around, set your eyes on somebody tonight, and, and the Holy Ghost will say, pray for that person. Yes, Rose. Yeah. <clears throat> that is a very, very painful thing to have, diverticulitis. Anybody that's ever had that, that hurts, okay? So anyway, that's her brother-in-law down in Texas, okay? Well, it's his own fault for being in Texas, amen? And Texas people are going to write me emails. Anyway, so pray for, pray for that. Uh, pray for our traveling band this week. Uh, headed down to Harrison, Arkansas. I'll be preaching there uh, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And Brother Charlie Jameson's going to be preaching before me. I'd get there early just to hear him preach. Amen. And uh, Southern, almost said Southern Comfort. <laughs> Southern Raised. Uh, bluegrass. That's that good bluegrass music. Amen. Good singers down there, and they'll be, they'll be singing down there as well. So looking forward to just hearing some good preaching. We're going to get down there and hear some Thursday night, all day Friday. And uh, I'll bring some of those messages back with me and preach them. Amen? Huh? Yeah, so yeah, so will Bradley. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Tell God thank you for what you have. Tell him, for, tell him, thank, you for the, tell him thank you for the bad, rotten day that you had today. Amen. See, that was in God's plan too. Remember, you're, you're the clay. Okay? And he knows how to work you to get you in his image. All right? So just trust that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your kindness, your goodness, Lord, for being our shepherd. Lord, we just thank you for all things. And, uh, Lord, this may have been a good day for some, but not a good day for others. <clears throat> but, Lord, we'll all go to bed tonight and we'll think about, Lord, what you've done for us. Lord, we think about it now. We thank you, Lord, for saving us and for calling us and for choosing us, helping us to believe in you and trust in you. And, Father, Lord, we just pray, Lord, uh, I, Lord, I've got somebody in my mind tonight that my eyes set upon tonight. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless this person. They're sitting here tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them and help them, give them encouragement. Help them to live for you, God. And Lord, Father, hear their prayer while they're praying tonight. And Lord, there's people watching out on the Internet, Lord. They consider this their church. And Lord, we're very thankful for that, and we're blessed by that. We pray, God, Lord, that you would give them a blessing as well. And Father, Lord, as they pray, Lord, would you hear their prayers. Father, we ask, God, that you'd bless uh, this one that Rose mentioned, her brother-in-law. We pray, Lord, that you'd help him. Father, we pray for those that are not saved. 
And Lord, while it's one thing to pray for someone that's sick or someone that's in need of this or that, <clears throat> Father, people need to, they need to be saved. They need the Lord. Lord, we're running out of time. Days are getting shorter. The time of your coming is just one day sooner than it was yesterday. And Father, we just pray, God, Lord, that people would turn to you. That, Lord, that you would use us to be witnesses for them. Lord, <clears throat> we're, we're in the sixth day. We believe that. We know that according to Scripture. It's still time to labor. So, Lord, help us to labor for you. Help us to follow you and to trust you, God. And give us rest tonight, Lord, from our, from our labor and the things that we have done. Lord, bless our heart and establish us according to your word, we pray. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, <clears throat> if you would. Hebrews uh, chapter 4. And I um, was just kind of looking over this and Gary and Sterling was sitting in the office and we were just kind of talking about one thing or another, and I had my mind on the passage tonight, and all of a sudden, just a conversation broke out, <clears throat> and um, we're just kind of going back over the teaching that we did last Wednesday, starting in Hebrews chapter 4, there is, uh, you know, the, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of us, and then the, the, the two places where the word if was mentioned in here, if we hold fast or if we continue to believe. In verse 11, um, if we go back to verse 9, there remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. Aren't you glad for that? Say amen. And I've always said, and I'm thankful for this, that I think the days that lie ahead of us are far better than the days that are behind us. And I, and I love to hear old preachers and older folk talk about the good old days, how they used to sleep with their windows open, the front doors open, screen door, you know, used to leave the house, not have to worry about anything. Days when, when people would walk to a revival meeting outside somewhere and sit and swat flies and mosquitoes while an old preacher preached. And they'd do that for weeks. And listen to that time, and, and boy, what, what a time, that, what it would be like to be back in those situations and to hear that preaching. But if all I had, as far as my faith and, and how to live, was 50, 70 years in the past, I don't have anything. Because I never lived in those days. I didn't live in those times. And so I can't look behind and see what everybody did back then and hold on to that. i got to look ahead. And I'm looking ahead and I think God's got something greater planned for his people. I know that he still has a rest promised for his people. And so that, that is coming. And then verse 10, for he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. As God did from his. So you see there that, that promise of the Sabbath day is not only a law, it's a blessing. It's showing you something that not only was, but it's showing you something that will be. And we talked about that last Wednesday. And then verse 11, let us therefore, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of what? Unbelief. He didn't say same example of not working. He said same example of unbelief. And I want you to notice the word fall here. Take your, hold your place there. Take your Bible. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. Or excuse me. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. Let me tell you what's going to happen. This is thus saith the Lord. I like to say thus saith the Lord. I like to, if I'm going to tell you something that's happened, I want to tell you what's going to happen according to the scriptures. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I preach on this quite often, I teach on it, because it's one of those things that we're looking at as, as far as what is going to happen, and how soon is it going to happen, I don't know. But he said in 2 Thessalonians 2, now we beseech you brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that's going to initiate the rest time by the way. And by, and by the way, I'll tell you that when Christ comes and gathers us up, it's, it's quitting time. Right. 
Amen. How many of you used to, yeah, we can punch out. Amen. How many of you used to work in a place where they'd blow a horn and that told you it was quitting time? You remember those days? I used to get so tickled at Sterling. He worked in a boiler shop for years. And he was used to a horn going off at a certain time, a horn going off for break, a horn going off to go back to work, a horn going off to tell him it was lunchtime, and then all this. He was used to that. And we'd be out and working in construction, and we'd be painting doors and paint trim, painting this, that, and the other. And when you're painting, when you get to a good stopping place, well, that would be a good time for lunch. I get so tickled at him. It'd be five minutes till noon, and I'd be done painting the door. Sterling, you want to take a break? Well, it's a little early yet. I don't know. Oh, come on. There's no horn here. Amen. And then he would piddle until, you know, that, about that time. They didn't sit down and take a break. It's hard to get them out of that pattern. Amen. Uh, but I'm telling you, the horn's going to blow one of these days, and I'm going to clock out. Of course, I don't remember a time starting to work here that I ever clocked in. Amen. I'm going to clock out, and the labor is over with. Somebody say amen. Okay, our gathering together unto him. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. You know what I like to do? I like it when people write me an email. Or they call here and they're troubled. And they say, Pastor Mike, we heard something on the internet. Somebody said that if you say Jesus, you're not saying it right and you're going to go to hell. Or somebody said if you do this wrong or do that wrong. You're... And I say, now just settle down. Let me tell you what saith the Lord here according to the scriptures. Amen. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. That would mean false Bibles. As that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Think about that for a while. For that day shall not come except there come a what? You see there was a falling in the wilderness wasn't there? They fell. The Bible says in one place they fell in one day. 23,000 people fell in one day just like that. Boom. That's a lot of people. Okay? That was more than on, than on September 11th. 23,000 in one day, gone, just like that. Why? Because they murmured in the wilderness. They refused to follow God anymore. They quit believing what he said. It was unbelief. Okay? The falling away is going to come, and that man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. And so you go back here to Hebrews chapter 4. Let us, uh, verse 11, let us theref- labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall. After the same example of unbelief, and I would encourage you, I would strongly encourage you, both those of you sitting here, those of you watching, study things that fall in the Bible. How art thou fallen from heaven on Lucifer? Things that fall, if you fall, that's not good. Amen? Um, Jezebel was, the, the, I th- there was two or three eunuchs, picked her up and cast her out of a window. Now, she was a witch, but apparently she didn't have her broom with her because she didn't just keep flying around like that you know what happened she fell there was a falling taking place okay Uh, the day in the wilderness 23,000 you know how they fell At, at one point the earth opened up and you know what they did they fell she swallowed them up that's what she's good at by the way and I'm telling you don't fall away Don't fall away. Okay? I'm going to illustrate some of this here in a little bit. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You see, and I'm going to to teach this down in Harrison. I've talked about this in a a broadcast I did recently. But it's it's a simple matter of contract law. And if you want to, if you don't like me because I believe in the King James Bible... Well, let me tell you that your dislike of me matters little because I'm under contract. This is the contract right here that I agreed to. It's, by the way, it's the contract that God agreed to. Amen? Here's the, here's the contract and it's written down. And when I got saved, I consented and came into covenant with God by way of this agreement. And God's terms is, he's going to forgive every one of my sins, adopt me in as a son, and I get to inherit everything that he created. Amen? 
You know what my you know what my responsibility is? Believe the contract. Believe what he said and don't ever call God a liar. Don't ever call the Bible a liar. Don't ever say, well, I, this is a good contract, but in, uh, in uh, paragraph, five, uh, paragraph 4 here, uh, section uh, 12, I, I think it probably should be worded differently. Don't do that. Can I hear you say amen? So you're just supposed to believe. And let me ask you, and we're gonna, I'm going to kind of unhook the train just for a minute because we were, we were playing this out in my office and we really liked it. So we wanted to put it on for you. Sterling was in there watching and he gave us a round of applause. When we were, no, he didn't really. <laughs> Sterling hadn't applauded anything in 47 years, all right? Uh, anyway, let me, let me do this, okay? I just happen to have, I like to use props. And I recorded the Watchman broadcast today, and I didn't have my props. I got ready to record, and I didn't have my props. And so I made Alicia fix my props up for me. It was two hard-boiled eggs. Okay? And I had a lot of fun with that. You, you'll have to wait till Sunday, okay? Well, this was laying on my desk. This is a pack of uh, combos. How many of you like these things? Pretty good. It's pretzel. It's a pretzel snack, and it's got a cheddar cheese goo in the middle of it. Now, cheddar cheese goo on anything is pretty good. Amen? So these are pretty... They were downstairs, and I had these on my desk, and we were just kind of illustrating this. And I'm going to let Gary come up here. He's been dying to do this now. Hang on a second, Gary. Hang yes. on. Yes. There. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you missed three right, on yeah. top. But that's okay. <laughs> Listen, you're missing a lot more than that on top. I can tell you that. <laughs> I missed three. <laughs> Okay, this is, and actually this works out pretty cool because this is bread. Okay, this is, the, this is the word of God. This is the Bible. This is the contract. Okay, and we were talking about the difference between, like some people say you're predestinated. Calvinism basically says that whoever is going to, and Calvinism is pretty, John Calvin for some reason just limited himself. He didn't get half of the Bible into his theology, and he, he left some things off there, so it's kind of flawed, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Calvinism says, whoever God says is saved, that's saved, that's it. You don't have to worry about anything, you don't have to do anything, you, God just said you're saved, and, and that's it, and, and it doesn't quite, I mean, there's some verses that talk about that, the, the Bible uses the term predestinated, and it's in there. Okay, but then it explains it a little bit later on as, as elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You actually were elected, you were chosen before God ever made the world. He chose you, but he chose you on the basis of one particular thing here, and that was his foreknowledge. Of what you were going to do and, and what you were and and your his foreknowledge of whether or not you wanted this or not. Okay, so let's say Gary, okay, help me out here. Gary's a worthless, no good, reprobate, heathen sinner. He knows me. Okay. And um, he's been, I mean, he's been chewing on the things of the world all his life. And he finally got to a point and he said, you know what? I'm sick of this stuff. And he, Amen. I don't want to drink this stuff anymore. I don't want to smoke this stuff anymore. I don't want to eat this stuff anymore. I don't want to chase after this stuff anymore. It's no good. It's killing me. I want, I want something better in life. And so God says, how about this? Okay. And now, now God did not say, if you perform, I'll give this to you. That's not what he said. Amen? Do you believe... That in this package right here is eternal life. Do you believe that this is yeah. eternal life? Being the word of God. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Amen. Now, Gary choose that. Now, I'm God. Didn't I know that he was going to choose that? Didn't I know that? Before there ever was a Gary, I knew that he was going to choose that. Okay? Let me, let me okay. look at, he's already, now, hang, hang on, what, this, what, this, we're going to stop your part of the illustration oh, here. Right, okay. okay? Oh, Jim here, he's same kind of reprobate, no good, scab sinner that Gary is, okay? But Jim still likes his sin, and God's been offering this to him for years, 
And a preacher says, I'd like to offer salvation to you. And Jim says, ah. Okay? And he won't take it. Did God know that? But he still had a choice, didn't he? He heard it. How can they, how can they hear without a preacher? So he, heard, he came to this church, and he heard me preach the gospel. And he had a choice. Okay? And let's say that Jim chose not to take it. And he doesn't take Look at him whimpering. And he doesn't take it. And God knew it. So was God going to choose this guy according to his? No. God's not going to say, well, I thought you were. You can come to heaven anyway. Right? Okay. Now, offer it back to Gary. By the way, there's plenty to go around. Whoever wants can drink of this freely. Amen? Okay, he's taking it. Okay? Now, in my office, I kept doing this and Gary, do, do like you did in my office. Let's do it according to the script, Gary. Okay? He kept, I kept doing this and he kept giving it back. And I said, no, Gary, where, where's, your, where's your salvation? I don't have it. Why? It's, well, you got it. I gave it back to you. He gave it up. You see, that's what, that's what he's getting at in Hebrews 11. Was a, he, God got them out in the wilderness. They gave up. They said, you know what? We want to go back to Egypt. Lot's wife wanted to go back to where? Sodom. She, does, she was not saved. She got destroyed in the land of Sodom. Even though she kind of walked away from it a little bit, she turned and wanted to go back. And that's crucial right there. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Sin will lie to you and tell you that the devil says, oh, wait a minute. You tired of the old sins? Got some new ones. Here, let's trade. Sin is a deceiver. And it will deceive you into thinking that maybe, maybe this is not worth it or maybe this is no good or anything like that. And, but the, see, Gary is acting, he's, he's showing his free will. Okay? And now let me ask, as of this point, let's say that now Gary dies in this state right here. Did God know that? So did God choose you? No. See how simple this is? But Gary says, you know what? I'm going to forsake everything. I've lost, I've already lost everything there is to lose in life. Twice, three, four times, lost it over and over and again. There's nothing here for me. So devil comes along and says, oh, no, that's mine. put that in your back pocket now like, like we did a while ago. Right. Okay? So now Gary's got it. He's going to keep it. He's going to hold on to it. Right. He's, he's put it in his heart. Okay? Just work with me here, okay? No pocket, no pocket. If you've seen him work, that's where his heart. No, just kidding, okay? He's got it. He's got it. He's got it down in his heart, and he's just determined. No man's going to take this away from me. Just like God said, no man's going to take this away from me. No man's. And he's just made up his mind, and God knows that. So now Gary's standing before God in His throne, and God's going to ask him, Gary, where's where's the combos? Where's the bread? Right here. I believe. He held fast. And God says, enter in. Okay? Now, let me tell you, let me explain Calvinism. Okay? Calvinism says that God stuck that down in there and Gary didn't know anything about it. Okay? Calvinism says, um, I'm God. Uh, Gary, you're here. Okay? Uh, where's, your, uh, where's your combos? I don't know. I don't know. What are you talking about? Yeah, what are you talking about? Check your back pocket. Oh, wait a minute. There's, yeah. there's, there's something in here. Yeah. How did those get in there? I don't know. That's Calvinism. That's Calvin. That's what, and by the way, there's, there's two schools of thought, Calvinism and Arminianism. Okay? Neither one of those guys, neither Calvin nor Arminius, were apostles. Does that make sense? Amen. I don't see any of their books in my Bible. And so I'm not choosing to follow John Calvin or Jacob Arminius. What I'm choosing to follow is this book right here. And this is the best that I can see in this book. This is how it works. Okay? God does not select him on the basis of his nothing. He selects him on the basis of he knows that he both believes and will hold fast what he believes. He's still laboring. 
And God knows the appointed time, at the appointed time, that's what he's going to have in his hand right there. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen. Okay? So, number one, go ahead, little baby, sit down. No, there you are. I, I don't want them. I didn't pay for them anyway, so go ahead. Okay? They'll be squandered before bedtime, I guarantee you. Verse 11, Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 11. By the way, Gary, come here for a second. Just everybody don't pay attention to me for a minute. All right. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us, theref- let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Labor. And how do we labor? Work. You work, but it's through, it's through belief. Yes. And sometimes, listen to me now. So, listen to me. Sometimes it's a struggle to believe. Let's be honest. Let's be dead. I'll be honest if you're not going to be. I'll tell you, I'm the preacher, and I've been believing the King James Bible now most of my life. Had a little hiatus where I didn't quite get it, amen, but I came back to it. And I've been, I've been, had, I've been looking at this book now for years. And every now and then, I'll have a run-in with the devil, and I won't think there's much to it. And it's a struggle for me to get my mind and my heart back to this idea, this Bible's right. You know why I'm telling you that? Not to show you how weak I am, but to show you that that's probably exactly what you've gone through a time or two in your own life as well. Let's all be honest since I'm being honest. Amen? I mean, that's how we want it here. Okay? I mean, we'd like all to stand up here and say, bless God, I've believed every word of this, never doubted at one time. That just stinks of pride. And I don't, I can't afford that. So I'm just going to be honest with you and say there's been times when I've really had to labor in the word. But thank God he's always helped me to get the victory. Amen. And I found out yesterday that the Bible was still right. And I found out today that the Bible was still right. And tomorrow morning I may struggle. But by the end of the day I'll still know that this Bible's right. Let me hear an amen out of somebody. So labor and work on it. Okay. By the way, by the way, let me throw this in here too. For those of you, I mean, and I I like works, okay? But you never get the cart before the horse, okay? You will labor for what you believe in. Amen? Amen? You will labor for what you believe in. Okay? How many of you, how many of you feel like going to help out and volunteer at the Hope Clinic for Women where they perform abortions. How many of you feel like going up there and just volunteering your time helping those girls get abortions? How many of you signing up for that? If you ra- listen, if you raised your hand, I'd pull, I, listen, I'd get you down the altar. You know why I'm not going up there to work for those people? I don't believe in that. I think it's murder. Amen. You would sooner catch me on the other side of the block saying this is wrong. Don't do that. Pleading, praying with those, for those young ladies going in there. Sometimes 13 years old going in there and killing their babies. That's what I believe in. I believe in helping them and encouraging them. Don't do this. Don't go that way. That's what I believe in and that's what I'm going to labor for. You see, it's not you labor to believe. You believe and it will cause you to labor. It will cause you to get up. And so people who just think riding the church rails into heaven is the way to go, they, they're not, I'm not telling them that they're lost because they won't work. I'm telling them that they won't work because they're lost. And I'm not one that says everybody ought to hear be painting, everybody ought to be knocking doors, everybody ought to be doing this. But I'll tell you something, the preacher up here doesn't need everybody up here helping me preach. But I do need you praying for me while I'm preaching. I do need you praying before the service starts. I need you to pray before I go down to Harrison, Arkansas and start opening my mouth down there to those people. I need you to pray while I'm up there behind that camera. I need you to pray about that. You can't come here, some of you, and help us make the videos, but you can say, God, give Brother Mike encouragement. Give him knowledge. Give him wisdom. God, bless his church and his family so that he can keep doing this. Somebody say, me, see, what you believe in, you'll work for. Amen. 
Verse 12. By the way, how many of you know this? You guys know this. I learned this from an old carpenter years ago. He said, Mike... A dull tool is a dangerous tool. How many of you know that? Amen. Amen. A dull tool. You get an old chisel out. Okay? And that thing, boy, that thing is razor sharp. And you just got to work just a little bit with that chisel to get it to do what you want. If you're working on a door or you're working on this or that and the other, you just got to do a little bit on there to get that chisel to do. But if that chisel is dull, I mean, you got to work that thing. And listen, something is going to get damaged or destroyed. Usually if it's in my hands, that's how it happens. And I want to tell you something. God made it easy for you. Look at verse 12. For. You know what that word for tells you? That everything he said is building up to verse 12. For the word of God is quick. Who in here can define the word quick for me? Madeline, what does the word quick mean? Huh? Wrong! Taylor, what does the word quick mean? Wrong! Ryan, what does the word quick mean? He's not going to answer. Alicia, what does the word quick mean? It means alive. You know how we get the, you know how the word quick was applied to something being fast? They said he ran quickly. You know what that means? He ran with a lot of life. Okay? Have you ever seen, have you ever seen me run? No. There ain't a lot of life in my running. So you'll never say he ran quickly. The word quick is alive. Don't tell me about your 4,000-year-old manuscripts that don't exist anymore. It's, that's where your Bible is. See, my Bible, I, I, I just, let's just look at the language of the Bible. For the Word of God is. Who in here knows whether that's past, present, Ryan, the word is, is it past, present, or future? Is. Boy, I wish I had you as a student. <laughs> Jim, the word is, is it past? Oh, Caleb, it's present, which means right now, 2,000 years ago. Is that what it means? No, that's past tense. It doesn't say the word of God was quick. Is. Is. You know what I bet? I bet if I went to the original Greek, it would say is. The Word of God is alive right now. Amen? This is what, this is what, this is my contract. It's still valid. Amen? You know what nullifies a contract? Somebody dies. One of the parties of the contract dies. Did you know you cannot have a contract with a dead man? Amen? Amen. Let's say that Jared was buying a car. Well, I'll tell you what. My dad did this one time. He bought a 1955 Chevy Bel Air four-door. It was. Okay? Bought it for 500 bucks. He turned around a couple years later and sold it to a guy he worked with for like 750 The guy paid him $500. And dad said, give me the other 250 and you can have it. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you soon. The guy fell in the river and drowned in the Mississippi River. And they pulled his body out, at, I don't know, a few weeks later. The contract is null and void. Dad got back on the car what he paid for the car. He doesn't owe the man his money back because the man is what? You cannot have a contract with a dead person... Neither can you have a dead contract and expect to live by it. Amen? This, see, God is so wise. God is smarter than the theologians. God figured it out. For the word of God is, present tense, alive, and is, right now, powerful. Do you still believe the Bible's got power? Say amen. Then read it. Read the thing. Read it. You say, well, I don't understand it. It's powerful. It'll work in you when you don't comprehend it. Right. How many of you take a little medicine every now and then? Swallow a little pill every now and then? How many of you do that? Swallow a little pill. Do you know what all's in that little pill? Do you know how it works? No. But you just know that when you take it, you just kind of feel better. 
Do you have to know how the medicine works in order for it to work? Now, it, it might do you some good to figure it out. And you say, well, you know, if I take it, it does this and this and this. I don't know how they put it together, but that's just how. You don't have to understand the medicine in order for it to work. And this Bible is medicine, by the way. Amen? Amen. And so when you've got ailments, when you've got diseases, when you've got sicknesses, when you've got anything else plaguing your soul, just take some of the medicine. You don't have to understand how it because it's powerful. It's potent. Right. Amen? Amen? And you'd, listen, you'd be surprised. A little bit will go a long way. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Boy, I'm glad I came out here to preach tonight. Amen? And sharper, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, I like this because the Bible says in, in Revelation 19, Jesus, when he comes back, proceeding out of his mouth is a sharp two-edged sword. Amen? Did you know that in the book of Proverbs, when I was doing this study, when God was having me read the book of Proverbs about four or five times, I kept reading the same place over and over again. This strange woman in the book of Proverbs. You know who that is, don't you? That's, that's the harlot woman. That's the harlot. That's the woman that wants to pull you out of church. That's the woman that wants to lure you away and get you to go serve something else. That's the harlot woman that's going to try to get your vineyard. Amen, that's her. Do you, know what, do you know what the Bible says about her words? They're like a two-edged sword. Now, in, in, in case that's messing you up a little bit, she's not quoting the Bible. Her words will cut. But I have something that's sharper than that. Amen? Remember, the book of Hebrews is all about... Dropping my stuff everywhere. The book of Hebrews is all about what's better. Amen? And so you're reading in the Old Testament and you see the words of a harlot woman and they're, they're like a two-edged sword. God's telling you, I've got something sharper than that. And if you encounter her, just pull your sword out and go to work. Amen? Yeah. Listen, the sharp tool will outdo the, the, the dull tool any day of the week. Somebody say amen. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And watch this now like this. And as a discerner of the thoughts. Thoughts and intents of the heart. How is it that Jesus could be around all those people and the Bible would say, and Jesus knew their thoughts, and Jesus knew their thoughts, and Jesus and He knew their thoughts. You know how that is? He's the Word of God. He was the living, breathing, standing up in front of them, teaching them Word of God. And when those Pharisees got around, Jesus just knew what was going on in their mind. You know why? Because He's the Word of God. The Word of God perceives thoughts. The Word of God will help you discern situations. Uh, Rick Warren. Man, I wish he would get saved. Amen. Rick Warren's got a new thing. He's got a new term now he's using against all the people that criticize what he's doing. You know what he calls them, Jared? Discernimentalists. Discernimentalists. And his, one of his recent tweets that he made was that he was blasting the discernimentalist for always griping against the people who are fulfilling the Great Commission, which was him. You know, what he's, you know what he's doing? He is separating. He's taking all the people that follow him and say, you don't want me to call you a discernimentalist, do you? Because that's bad. You know, what, you know what a discernimentalist is? It's a combination of someone who discerns and someone who is a fundamentalist who believes in the foundational principles of the Bible. Someone who discerns is using the Word of God, and they're looking out what's going on in their church, and they're saying, uh, that's not right. When a pastor puts a stripper pole up on the stage next to the pulpit, And he fills his congregation full of people who, when they walk in and see that, they cannot discern that that's not right. I would walk in that church, see that. I wouldn't even hang around to see how bad it was. I walk out. I'm out. There's no way. There's no way in the world I'm going to sit and be staring at that nasty, vile, disgusting. There's even a church right now that the women, there's a lady in some church that's teaching 
the women of a church strip her aerobics with a pole. What I'm telling you is when you get in this Bible, you'll be able to sit in any congregation, hear what's going on, see what's going on, and say, this is not right. Amen. Because my, my Bible has, has helped me to discern not only what that preacher's doing, but what he's got on his mind. Amen? I know we're not supposed to judge people because we, we might get it wrong. But I guarantee you, you walk into some man's church and he's got a stripper pole up on the stage. I can tell you, according to the word of God, what he's got on his mind. Right. Doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Somebody say amen. 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 <clears throat> Verse 13. And by the way, be careful about using the sword on everybody else first. Use it on yourself. If you want to know whether you're in the right, get the Bible out. It'll tell you whether you're in the right or not. You know what God did call me? He called me. His name is Richard. Uh, he is from Texas. Hey, my brother. He calls just to cheer me up. He calls early in the morning to cheer me up. He must know that early in the morning I'm not all that cheery. And he calls me and he just cheers me up. And he, he saw something I did about contract law. And he said, let me tell you what I used to do, brother. He said, I used to act as a mediator between a company and the union. And he said, they would hire me as a mediator to mediate whether the company was in violation of the contract or the union workers was in violation of the contract. And he said, that's what I did. And he said, everything you said in that broadcast was right. He said, it's all according to the terms of the contract. And he said, if, I had, if there was a dispute, then it was my job to go learn that contract. Go learn that contract. And he said, once I had it in my mind, I'd sit down with those fellows. And he said, it was binding arbitration. He said, I had the final say on it. And he said, if I found out that the union workers was in violation, I'd get them. If I found out the company was in violation, I'd get them. He said, but that was my job. And he said, it was all done. He said, I had to use discernment whether or not it was right or wrong or not. And I want to tell you something. You judge your actions. Number one, young people... Listen to me. Your preacher's trying to teach you something that'll help you. Number one, do not judge your actions based upon others' actions. Do not judge your actions based upon what your mom and your dad did. Do not judge your actions based upon what feels right or what feels good at the moment. Don't judge your actions on that basis. I need some adults to say amen. It'll cost you. Yes. Amen. You let some teachers, some Sunday school teachers and some preachers teach you how to use this Bible for discernment to know whether or not what you're doing is right or wrong. Yes. Amen. amen. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight. You know what that's saying? God sees everything. Amen? Now I'm going to give you a little conspiracy theory. Okay? How many of you want to hear my conspiracy theory? Amen. God can see everything. You know God can see what's going on in, in Africa right now and what's going on in, and they're on the other side. But God can see it all. Yes. Amen? Isn't that cool? He, can, he knows the number of hairs that are, are or are not on your head. And your house has a layer of dust in it. You know what that is? Most of that's human skin. God knows every one of those particles. He's counted every one of them. He knows every bug, every fly, every cell, every amoeba. He knows everything. He knows every atom in every star in every corner of the universe. God knows that. The devil said in Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High, but he can't quite pull that off. Right. He's not God. So you know, what he, you know what I think he's doing right now? He's building a network where he can see everything that's going on. I, I literally think cameras everywhere yeah. are part of that structure. Yeah. He needs a network. He can't do it by himself because... The, the DARPA, the Defense Agency Research Projects Group, has a logo that says 
Knowledge is power. And if I, if I, uh, if I followed Madeline around like a little shadow and I knew everything she said, everything she thought, everything she did, if I knew everything that I was, that I, that there was to know about her. I like you, Madeline, by the way. Okay. Okay. That's because I don't know you. All right. If I knew everything there was to know about Madeline and every thought and everything that you did, I would have so much power over you. I could make you do whatever I wanted to. Amen. See how that works? Facebook. <coughs> Facebook. Did you know the CIA put seed money to get Facebook off the ground? Proven fact. Proven fact. Okay? Just, just saying. Okay? This will help us make sure that we're doing right. Amen? Because we know that God is watching. There's nothing, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest. Hey, God, God loves you, Madeline. And he knows everything there is to know about you. Right. He still loves you. He still loves your dad. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He knows everything there is to know about her daddy. And he loves him. You know why? Because we have a great high priest. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our bag of combos. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Yeah. You know why Jesus is so good at what he does? Because he's been here. And we go to him and say, Jesus, I was tempted and I failed. And Jesus says, I know what that's like to be tempted. I know how easy it is to fail. I know that. Jesus, can God forgive me? Jesus says, let me ask my father. Father, forgive them. And the Father forgives. Amen? Amen. That's our great high priest who knows everything, yet without sin. Let us therefore, all Bradley, Bradley, Sitting there next to me one morning. The Mormon church don't want me no more. They kicked me out. They didn't like my girlfriend. <laughs> hey, Amen. Yeah, it wasn't her. It wasn't Megan. We, hey, we like Megan. Hey, Amen. <laughs> they said I couldn't go back no more. And they said I had to confess all my sins to the bishop. And I went, what? Oh, yeah, we have, to, uh, we have to confess all of our sins to the bishop. And the Holy Ghost of God was telling me what to say. And I looked over at him and I said, you didn't tell him everything, did you? And he looked at me and he looked down and he said, no. I said, why? Well, the Holy Ghost said, ask him why. And I said, why? And he said, because I'm afraid to, looking down. And the Holy Ghost quoted scripture. The Holy Ghost said, let us therefore come boldly. And Bradley, the Holy Ghost was over here talking and Bradley's here. And he was saying, remember that scripture? And Bradley finished the scripture. Let us say, you remember that. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. And you know what? God started working. Listen, you were saved 10 billion years ago. Amen. You know why? God knew him. God knew him. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And at that time, that young man was in such a time of need because everything, listen to this now, listen, young people, listen to this. This is your your Sunday school teacher. This is his real life that he went through. Everything that he was chasing after and wanted to, I was talking to him, I know what he wanted. He wanted so bad to go on mission He wanted to be the white shirt and bicycle guy. 
Okay? He wanted bruises right here. You know why? That's people going, get off my porch! <laughs> right? That's what he wanted. And you know what God did? God, if God loves you the same way, he'll do the same thing for you. God took what he wanted more than anything in this world, and he went, and said, now what are you going to do, big fella? And the only place he had left to run was to the throne of mercy. I like it. Find grace to help in time of need. And I can tell you, I've heard about the angry God that's mad at everybody all the time that doesn't want to forgive sins. But when I read the scriptures, I don't find that God, especially in the New Testament. Now, I see that's in his nature in the old. But when I see the new contract now that we're under, I don't see that God anymore. I see the God that is just waiting for you to come to the throne of grace to find help. The high priest who's been there, who knows what it's like to say to you, I'm on your side. I'm your advocate. You know what that means? It's your lawyer. I, uh, listen, I, you, those of you who know me, you know I love the law. I love to study legal things. And when I read this King James Bible, I see... I see so much legality here. I see the accused. I see the accuser. I see the judge. And I see, a, I see a defense attorney named Jesus Christ who's saying, listen, I know the law better than anybody. I can get you off. How can you do that? I've already paid for it. It's already done. Somebody say amen. Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> Take your time, Jimmy. I know. Heavenly Father, it's so sweet to come into your house tonight. So sweet, God, to hear precious words that we all need to hear. And, uh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for that bag of pretzels sitting on my desk. I do, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, that you just, if we just read the Bible and believe the Bible, Lord, it's just that simple. It's how it works. And, Lord, the, the terms of the contract are that you'll save us. Un, just, you, do, you don't ask us to do anything, but our term of the contract is what we believe it. And, Father, you know I believe it. And you knew that before, even before I came around to it, God, you knew it. That's... I guess that's why you had so much mercy on me. You knew, God, I could be broken. You knew, God, that I could be shamed and humbled. You knew that. And I thank you for that. God, my actions, both past, present, and future, are not hid from you. The ones, Lord, that, uh, the things, whether good or bad, that I haven't even done yet, they're not hidden from you. And you know them. Lord, I'm putting my trust and my confidence, Lord, because I don't know what the future holds, but I know that you do. You're the one that I trust. You're the one that I hold to. Thank you, God, for this dear, dear book that you have given us, the guide of our life. Help us to read it, live by it, study it, meditate on it, memorize it. But, Lord, just help us, dear God, to take it in so that it will work. It's powerful. Thank you, God, for this book for our faith, and for Jesus Christ, our high priest. And all of God's people, we pray this in his name, Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. 
we all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believed in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in his word, and God has never broken his word. God promised in his word that he would forgive you and that he would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.